talk about weather and everything. Yeah. So, by the way, thank you very much for, to everybody for, for joining us for this uh, inaugural seminar, our uh, colloquium series. Um, to give you some perspective, um, this is being kind of uh, hosted by the women scientists and engineers. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Um, when, when I was at Oak Ridge, we did this, and uh, I think it was a fantastic event. And so I figured it's great to start with the same person. Sunita gave that talk as well. It was an awesome event. Uh, but uh, we also felt that this is an opportunity where we can start to do something more substantial. So uh, I think we first welcome Sunita Satyapal. We've talked a lot of times with that, you know. Um, so if it's okay to start Sunita, uh, welcome her. And um, I also want to give you a little bit of the background uh, of what's going on. Uh, when I came here a few months ago, a lot of the young people said, hey, we have no clue who our program managers are. You know, I think that's typically the answer I got at Oak Ridge as well. So we said, okay, we'll take this double opportunity to have a, a program director come and tell us what does it mean to be a program director? Now, what are the career options? What is she doing as PD of a $100, $110 million program? Uh, where does she see young people fitting into her game plan? And as we were thinking about this, we said, hmm, maybe we should do it a little bit more broadly. So what you will see happen, this is the first of a series of, of lectures. Uh, we're bringing in essentially all of the tech program directors from EERE. So Min Lee, who runs Sunshot now, he will be here in a few weeks. Roland Rizla, who runs the buildings program, he'll be here. And I'm thinking that we will also go to the after science and bring in key program directors, ADs from there, so that we get to find out directly from them, not through our managers and all the other stuff, what uh, they're interested in. How do they make decisions? They, and I can tell you how many people say they make a lot of tough decisions lot on almost on a minute by minute basis. So. Uh, sometimes I don't envy program managers at all because it's a really tough business to be in. But they're very committed people, I can tell you that for sure. I was incredibly impressed with the, the amount of effort and, and dedication you know, that the folks in ERE put into the, to this whole job. So uh, that's kind of the, the, the background for this. So you will see over summer and going into fall a whole series of such lectures. And I hope it will be useful for you guys. It'll give you a perspective on how to go about thinking about writing proposals, how to think about new research directions, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, with that, I will not take time away from Sunita. Sunita, welcome once again. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you, um, Ramesh. Um, so today, I was not going to give the traditional technical presentation, so I was told to you know, talk about some general topics as well. Um, and first of all, I wanted to uh, thank the, um, the Women Scientists and Engineering Council. As mentioned, I gave a similar talk at Oak Ridge, and thanks for the invitation. Um, it's great to see the activity. And um, first of all, um, I wanted to start with the human brain. So the human brain tends to categorize and if everybody takes a moment for a second and look around the people around you, and when your eyes see a human being, your brain immediately processes gender, age, ethnicity, all these categorizations. And then when your ears hear a human being speak, your brain immediately processes you know, what language are they speaking, what's their accent, make numerous other judgments, uh, even before you listen to a word they're saying. Um, so basically, we focus on the wrapping paper, on the box and the wrapping paper, and we don't pay any attention to what's inside the human being. Um, so we tend to classify, I think we all know that as scientists, if you take a, a surface, you know, take different materials, you know that when you go in, you know, you do uh, electron microscopy, you know, what's on the inside, if you go further and further down, you know, protons, electrons, quarks, it's all pretty much the same. And so we don't focus on the inside, we focus on the outside. So um, 
which is natural because our senses perceive what's on the outside, right? So, but we do have a brain, so we do have the capacity to know that the inside is not the covering. <laughs> so um, I think just that awareness is really impo important. So I wanted to say right up front that my talk is not gonna be about you know, any categorization or classification. It's not for women or you know, men. Many days, nowadays, um, stay-at-home dads experience discrimination too from different kinds. So, so anyway, so there's no categorization. My, my whole talk is about human beings in general and advice for, for everybody. Um, and so I'd like to start with an ancient um, Eastern saying about the human mind and how the, the human mind works. Um, so we have information that's all around us, like rain, it falls equally on everything. Um, and the human mind is like a cup, and you can gather that information and then process it, turn it into knowledge. Um, and there are three types of tendencies to avoid uh, with the human mind. Uh, one of them is that you, know, you have all this information, uh, you know, that you can gather, help you in your career, making decisions, everything, um, but, or, or anything, even if it's not career related, um, but very often we're not pointed in the right direction. <laughs> so it's like a cup that's upside down. You're not gathering anything. The second type of tendency to avoid is um, you're getting information, um, but it's, there's a lot of distraction and it's basically in one ear, out the other, you're not really retaining it. And so that is like a cup with a hole in it. Um, and then the third type of human tendency to avoid is much more subtle and it, it's harder to see, but you have a cup, it's pointed in the right direction, you know, it's gathering the information, there are no holes in it, but you have this constant internal commentary that's going on in your brain and it's, you're, you're judging, you're, you don't even realize it, you're, you have this sort of criticism, like, oh no, I need to do that, like, how am I gonna get to the next thing on my to-do list? You're, you're like constantly you're not in control of your brain, and that's like a cup with poison in it. So those are the three um, tendencies to avoid, and um, what I'm hoping today, for the next half an hour, everybody can keep their cup up, <laughs> Um, with no holes in it and no negative uh, commentaries <laughs> um, and try to get as much information as you can um, that hopefully will be helpful uh, for you and, and learn something new. And so what I'd like to, to do is, is at, that is actually a hard thing to do, which is why I always like this quote. Um, thinking is the hardest work there is, which is probably why so few engage in it. <laughs> and if you think about even our day-to-day -day tasks, even as scientists and engineers, it, you tend to just do the easy things first. You know, you do the check in the box, the administrative things. It tends to take up our time. And um, we just, it's hard to do the, the hard things to actually think, and we need time for, for that. Um, and so I wanted to mention a few quotes, which some of you may have heard because of our previous Secretary of Energy and you know, his time at, at LBNL, he may have um, used these before, but so these are a little bit outdated, but just to, sort of as an eye opener on the importance of thought and, and thinking, really optimizing our brains. Um, in 2009, 51% of US patents were awarded to non-US companies. Um, China has gone from 15th place to fifth place in international patents. Um, the World Economic Forum ranks the U.S. as 48th in quality of mathematics and science education. Um, China's Tsinghua and Peking universities are the two largest suppliers of students who receive PhDs in the United States. Um, in less than 15 years, China has moved from 14th place to second place in published research articles. Um, it goes on and on, um, eight of the 10 global companies with the largest R&D budgets have established R&D facilities in China, India, or both. And in a survey of global companies planning to build new R&D facilities, again, this is not manufacturing, these are R&D 
facilities, you know, where the innovation is going to happen. 77% say that they will build in China or India. Um, an American company recently opened the world's largest private solar R&D facility in Xi'an, China. Again, this is R&D, not manufacturing. So, you know, there's, there's so much happening. Um, and here's, unfortunately, another example of why all of this is important. It's not just about our careers. Um, and you can see, who's working here? 24% um, of New York high school students um, don't know that coal provides most of the power for the U.S. 40% of Americans can't name a fossil fuel. People think fossil fuels are the same as dinosaurs. <laughs> um, and, you know, more than half Americans think that nuclear power contributes to climate change. So if, if you look at the, you know, the challenges that we're facing, I mean, it's, it's huge. So, um, so I was going to intersperse some kind of examples from, from my career. And when I got my first job, um, so it, I got my uh, PhD in physical chemistry, laser diagnostics, and um, laser regressions from Columbia University, and did applied um, engineering physics at Cornell, um, also laser diagnostics and so forth. And but but I thought I wanted to teach. And when I got my very first job, it was a visiting professor job, um, and I still remember walking to class, um, and the. Um, there was a student who came, who came up to me and said, are you a freshman? <laughs> so talk about the wrapping paper and uh, covering. And so I said, actually, no, I'm a professor. <laughs> it turned out she was in my class, so I think she felt bad. How many people here are professors with joint appointments or anything? Yeah, so you can, you can imagine. Um, and then, um, unfortunately, I had one of the classes I taught was quantum mechanics, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 8 a.m. in the morning. And so <laughs> I know. And I thought the only way, I think, how, how is this going to work? They think I'm a freshman. The only way this would work is every class I gave them a quiz, a five-minute quiz, and said it's only going to be on the lecture before, but you need to have a good foundation. You just you know, can't afford to fall behind. And I had a you know, whole intricate process where if they got extra points in the quizzes, they could do, you know, make up for bad scores in the exams and everything. So, um, so I gave a quiz every, every class. But anyway, so I'm going to start with a little quiz now um, <laughs> to make sure you're uh, awake after lunch. And, um, but don't worry, it's, it's going to be not, not yet the technical part. Um, so if you look at private investment in R&D, this is in the U.S. Um, as a function of sales, basically of revenue, so not the government funding, um, what percent do you think is reinvested in pharmaceutical? Any guesses? 15? 15? That's good. I think I heard 20. How about um, aerospace and defense? Oh, it's all over the place there. 11. Um, computers, electronics? 7, yeah. Cars, automotive? Yep. Okay, and the winning question, what about energy? Point four two. So um, you know, which is you know, which is definitely <laughs> a scary thought. Um, so that's you know partly why our, our all of our efforts are really really critical. You know, on the, the public, the government funding side. So we have you know obviously a lot of um, issues. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about our activities. The transportation sector, as you know, is is also really critical. We have um, we use. 21% of the world's oil supplies, only 2% of the proven reserves. I think we all know that transportation is, you know, very heavily dependent on petroleum, and 70% of all the petroleum is uh, used for transportation. Almost a third for um, third of transportation is um, third of greenhouse gas emissions is due to the transportation sector, and then we. Are spend, we've been spending, of course, depends on the price of oil, but um, we have been spending almost a billion dollars a day on imported oil. So when you think about that, that kind of money that we're spending, in addition to the whole environmental um, challenge, is huge. You can see that you know, most of it's in the, um, 
light duty vehicle sector. That's where we've been focusing. Um, and I think we all know that uh, the president's been you know, very strongly supportive of uh, an all of the above energy strategy. Um, so I think things are moving in the right direction. And then I'll spend most of my time talking about my program, the fuel cell um, area. And uh, fuel cells and hydrogen are part of the, the portfolio. And you can see our secretary at the auto show looking at a uh, Toyota vehicle. Um, and um, we do have, uh, we were very happy to have the secretary drive the first commercial uh, fuel cell vehicle. How many people have heard about the Toyota Mirai? Okay, good, so most people have heard about it. And so um, we had a, a very nice little event. Um, I told his uh, Secret Service that he was gonna drive just around the L'Enfant Plaza, make a U-turn and come back. You can see me and Ruben getting into the back seat. <laughs> um, and immediately when he got into the car, he floored it and he did not go the chosen path. He went all the way on um, Independence, the 12th, and his Secret Service was chasing after us. <laughs> um, but anyway, so we, we uh, did have this Sorry, <laughs> this, this screen, it's too small here, I can't. <laughs> you can see my hand in the back. <laughs> okay, well thank you. So our public affairs, originally I said, you know, this would be a small private meeting. No, you get to see the technology, no press. And then our public affairs was right after the State of the Union and they said we want some good press and visibility for the secretary. And so um, they put the camera on and then they posted it and got, so hopefully you can go in and give it a like. <laughs> or, um, so got some good, good press there. So, um, but anyway, so given the importance of the transportation sector, as you all know, EERE reorganized. Uh, I think many of you know into three, instead of just renewables and energy efficiency, we have a sustainable transportation sector now. Um, and that has three offices. Um, my office, high fuel cell technologies, vehicles, we do the combustion, light weighting, all the battery work, and then uh, biofuels. And there are specific goals. Um, I think you're all probably aware of the climate uh, action plan, you know, reducing oil imports, long-term greenhouse gas emission reduction, um, as well as near term. And, you know, for, uh, and I keep uh, thinking about how 1990, the, the future always seems a lot further away than the past. And 1990, or at least for me, doesn't seem that long ago. Um, and that same amount of time is going to be 2035. And, you know, for some of us, 1980 doesn't seem that long ago. And in that same amount of time, it's gonna be 2050. <laughs> you know, we're almost there. It, does, it doesn't seem that way, but um, it's, it's really scary when you, you think about it. We have to get our act together. And so um, basically, we're looking at the portfolio. We're, we're gonna have to have a portfolio, but we have to focus on the long term as well. Um, and so hydrogen is a piece of that. And um, here, uh, basically, you know, hydrogen, I think many of you know, of course, especially with LBNL and JCAP and all the history here, has the highest uh, energy content by mass uh, of fuels, uh, 120 megajoules per kilogram. Of course, as you put more uh, carbon in there um, and go eventually towards gasoline, you have very high energy density because this is obviously is a you know, low energy density gas at room temperature. Um, so hydrogen has, you know, three times higher um, specific energy. That's why it was used by NASA for space applications. But of course, it's much worse in terms of energy density. Um, so our focus is hydrogen. And in terms of fuel cells, it's actually a very exciting time in the industry. Um, there's been uh, 30, more than 35,000 fuel cells shipped worldwide, you know, steady growth 
you know, this is much smaller than you know, the solar sector or others because it's still in the couple hundred megawatt scale, no, nowhere near gigawatts, um, but very consistent, steady growth. Um, and fuel cells can be used for not just transportation, for large stationary, for small portable power, you know, efficient energy conversion, no combustion, zero emissions, um, you know, just water is the product and fast in space. When I was in industry, um, I spent eight years in industry before joining DOE, which was almost, or more than 11 years ago now. Um, and the, for the fuel cells uh, that UTC uh, built, the astronauts actually drink can drink the water coming out of the fuel cell, so completely zero emissions. Um, and uh, basically huge markets because these can cover stationary, transportation, portable. Um, and any guesses on where you think most of these fuel cells were being shipped and manufactured? Um, Japan, yeah. So, yeah, Tim. Uh, you know, so basically, we have major companies now, Panasonic, Toshiba, that are building small residential fuel cells. And they actually, most of them operate on, on gas, on natural gas. And after Fukushima, there's even more interest in terms of reliability. And so the fuel cells pro provide electricity for the home and hot water for the home. Um, and we had a, a fuel cell company that was manu targeting the small residential market and basically they filed chapter 11. So we have no really, so to speak, um, fuel cell company looking at small stationary residential fuel cells in the US. So, but it was, and these are still very expensive. They're heavily subsidized by the government. So there's a lot of, Japan's budget is 400 million per year just in the fuel cell area, the government funding alone, not, not including industry. But there's lots of good, you know, lots of progress. That was a very exciting time. So we have the car companies announcing plans. Toyota um, is planning to sell commercially here. They already announced in um, Japan and Germany. Hyundai is leasing and also already started selling in Europe. And then Honda has plans for 2016 to start um, selling. So now switching gears a little bit and going to the um, the benefits, um, I think one question has always been, it's much more efficient to use a fuel cell rather than combustion, but you still have to produce the hydrogen. So we don't want to overhype the, the fuel cell piece, and you have to look at the complete well-to-wheel um, pathway. And so if you look at today's um, gasoline vehicle, roughly 430 grams um, CO2 per mile, and if you look at future, these are all projected future uh, advances. You can get lots of advances with light weighting, improving combustion efficiency, and basically cut the cost in half. And you can use fuel cell vehicles. Um, and even if you produce the hydrogen from natural gas, distributed natural gas, you can cut the emissions in half. And of course, if you go to renewables, you can cut the emissions um, from, today, from the future gasoline vehicles even Further, and then of course, compared to today's gasoline vehicles, you can get you know, over 90% reduction in well to wheels emissions. And so, we also uh, have, and I'll just, um, we have references here, but we look at all the different vehicle pathways, and there's obviously a range because there's a range of estimates in terms of efficiency and so forth. So, you can see we, we need the whole portfolio and we need to get total well to wheel greenhouse gas emissions down, but the devil's in the details. So a lot depends on how you produce electricity and you know, all those assumptions along the way. So I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware that we have all these assumptions posted online uh, across all the, the offices. Um, so now moving on to, to our office, we have very specific targets that are driven by what's needed, what the system needs to be competitive. So we need to get the cost down to $40 a kilowatt. Um, these are 2020 targets. We have durability. Um, storage and hydrogen and so forth. And there's a huge number of challenges still, fuel cell cost, durability, production, delivery, infrastructure. So we're working on all of these uh, areas. And then this gives you a snapshot of our specific targets and where we think we are. So in terms of fuel cell cost, we do a, a design for manufacturing analysis, ground up analysis based on high volume. So based on the latest 
state of the art in the laboratory, so catalysts, membrane MEAs, and so forth, uh, we could be at $55, but when we look at low volume, we're still up at the $280 a kilowatt. Um, and then same with hydrogen production, assuming high volume estimates and you know, modeling, projected modeling, uh, we can get pretty close, uh, but in reality we're actually, we're, we could, depending on how you produce the hydrogen, it could be even higher. And then same with hydrogen storage on board the vehicle. So this gives you a nice snapshot and then some of the key challenges um, where we think we need to focus. So uh, non-platinum um, group metals, uh, efficiency, reliability, uh, carbon fiber, so a number of topic areas that we're working on. And I thought that I would um, basically share one example. So how many people here are in the catalysis field? A few people? Okay, so I think it's a diverse uh, audience. But uh, one would think that, you know, catalysis has been going on for decades, that there wouldn't be that much innovation. Um, but there was one example, and it was actually UC Berkeley, LBNL, and Argonne, so I thought it would be appropriate to um, highlight. And there was some strong science, but also a little bit of serendipity. So they started with a crystalline um, platinum nickel three uh, catalyst. And they left it in the solvent for a little longer than planned, a couple of weeks exposed to air. And what they found is that it started to spontaneously de-alloy from the inside out uh, over time and got, became this sort of um, hollow nanoframe structure and um, bec became platinum three nickel on the surface. And th they published a, a science paper on this, and this shows you the, the cartoon where you can see the oxygen reduction reaction and greater uh, surface area and access, mass transport for the oxygen inside the structure. And then this shows you the actual electron microscopy results uh, proving that's a hollow structure. So it's always amazes me, this is you know nanometer scale on meters, projected on meter scale for you to see. Um, and then what they did, so the actual uh, activity was you know, over 20 times higher than conventional platinum on carbon. And then what they did was they incorporated an ionic liquid inside the nanoframe cage and to increase the oxygen concentration inside that cage. And they increased the mass activity even more, 30 times higher catalyst mass activity than conventional platinum on carbon. And of course, this is the catalyst only result, so it's very important to just demonstrate the MEA. And so hopefully um, we'll, we'll keep, um, keep the pressure up to make sure we get data from the lab <laughs> on the MEAs. But anyway, th I thought I'd show just one you know, little example where there was huge progress where you, you wouldn't really think that there could be innovation. Um, so now moving on to hydrogen production. Here our strategy in the near term is to use natural gas um, distributed or, or, um, or central production natural gas, deliver it to the station. You can always also use electrolysis. And then in the long term, that's where things like PEC and JCAP become really, really critical because we can have to have renewable um, hydrogen production. And the key is you can produce hydrogen from diverse domestic resources, so we wouldn't have dependence on just one resource. Um, and then we have a number of approaches for delivery, uh, in the long term, looking at pipeline transport um, and so forth. And so similar to fuel cells, we look at the cost of hydrogen projected to high volume for a number of different approaches, and we continue to, to track that as we make progress. Uh, with natural gas, we can al already get close to our targets. So ultimately, pr production and delivery, we have to be at $4 per kilogram. It just so happens, just for that piece of information, one kilogram of hydrogen has the same energy content, lower heating value, as one gallon of gasoline. So unlike ethanol, where you have to make a conversion, you use that term interchangeably. So one kilogram is one GGE. But because the fuel cell vehicle is so much more efficient, you actually need half the hydrogen compared to your gasoline. So that's a kind of a good uh, rule of thumb. So, um, so for example, if, if your gasoline cost is $4, um, and your fuel cell car is twice as efficient, your hydrogen cost that you could tolerate is, you know, could be even $8 to, to give you an idea. You, the cost of filling your tank would be the same. Um, but we, the key is, you know, we need to drive the cost down. So, so again, all this is information is available. 
And I do want to announce that we have an H prize. Uh, how many people have heard of the H prize? Okay, just a couple. So again, see if you're not in the field, it's, it's hard to keep track, but we announced a uh, $1 million prize. This, we have legislation on this. Um, and it's for either a small scale, uh, like home size hydrogen generator or a community size hydrogen generator. And it's open for, for two years. The teams are just forming now. In fact, we had a public webinar yesterday. It'll be posted on our website on the criteria. And you can post, uh, you know, if you're interested in joining teams, on the website. And then uh, in a couple of years, they'd actually build the system. We would test and validate it. And the winner would get a million dollars. So we're complementing our traditional uh, grant process by offering sort of the, the, the prize approach. Um, and in terms of hydrogen storage, that's the other big challenge. We have physical storage, of course. You know, in ambient conditions, hydrogen is a lightweight gas, not very useful. Um, if you continue to uh, pressurize down to, or, or up to, I should say, 700 atmospheres, that's what the car companies are using, the high pressure storage tanks. They go through drop testing, bonfire, even gunfire testing. You know, the huge emphasis on safety. So there's you know thousands of these. They're like sort of like CNG vehicles. There are no issues there. Um, but in the long term, we've been focusing on materials-based storage. So if you look at liquid hydrogen, the energy density is you know around 70 grams hydrogen per liter. And what a lot of people don't realize is if you go to metal hydride, for instance, you can get double the hydrogen density. You know, you go to atomic hydrogen within the interstitial lattice, and that's higher energy density than liquid. You know, usually that's not, not intuitive. So we've, you know, done a lot looking at um, solid state materials that can store hydrogen. Um, and to give you a snapshot of where we are, um, when you look at high pressure compressed hydrogen, um, a big part of it is the carbon fiber. So the, the precursor for the carbon fiber, the conversion, the processing, all this is carbon fiber and then balance the plant and assembly. And then a huge challenge is the compression. So when you think about having the hydrogen at the station, filling your vehicle, the, comp the cost of compression is most of the cost of that hydrogen. So we do need you know, better compressor efficiency, other alternatives, um, and that's the main uh, takeaway there. And um, how many people have heard of tri-generation? Is anyone? Okay, a few people. But I think everyone's heard of co-generation or CHP, so that's combined heat and power. And so we demonstrated the world's first tri-generation system um, in Orange County. It was a wastewater treatment plant, and um, it took it can take either natural gas or waste biogas and feed it into a high temperature fuel cell. And you can see on the anode, you can actually get, so you get heat and power like in any fuel cell, but you also can get a slipstream of hydrogen off the anode. So you have three products. So you have that additional value added product of um, heat and electricity. And so the idea was, and you, you have, this station has hydrogen as well as natural gas, and you can have you know, electricity to charge your, your EVs as well. So that's an example of kind of a, a holistic system approach. So that's another kind of new um, tidbit of information. But you know, all of these, if you think about our technologies and how technology advances, the early days are very, very different from you know, the, the later days. So um, you, know, you can think about the cell phone um, <laughs> and how that's evolved. Some of them didn't quite work, um, like that one. And then you look over time, at how technologies have evolved. I always like this one. Um, if you can read that, that, that's right. Our ancestors had tails and right, they had buttons. <laughs> so uh, you know, the, it, we just have no idea how things are going to evolve. Things evolve, have evolved so quickly in such a short time. Um, and so now I wanted to switch gears and talk about infrastructure, because that's where the huge challenge is. Um, and if you look at what's happening in other countries, we actually do have a formal international partnership with 17 countries. The European Commission, the State Department was involved, and this was a decade ago. We signed, the, it's called IPHE, the International Partnership for Hydrogen and Fuel Cells in the Economy. And so we meet um, at least twice a year with all these countries and share plans from the government side of you know, what we're funding, you know, how do we progress 
this technology. And so this gives you a snapshot. I know it's hard to read, but the key is Japan, Germany, Scandinavia, the UK, um, all have, they're all evolving towards a public-private partnership approach. So there are a number of companies you know, recognizing that it's, it's going to be hard to have you know, governments pay for, for infrastructure. Um, and they're developing plans. So the, the main plan is the cluster approach. So if you look at Germany, they're going to start with four specific regions, um, build out the hydrogen stations. Um, their, their plan shows about 400 st stations needed to get to cash flow positive. And then they'll start connecting those um, clusters and eventually um, have accessibility for, for everyone for, for hydrogen. They've already started uh, with wind and um, to some extent, mostly wind, but not so much solar, uh, to produce hydrogen. So you basically electrolyze water with the wind and then you store the hydrogen and you can feed that hydrogen into a pipeline. They've actually done this um, for either fuel or then they feed it back to the grid. So hydrogen energy storage, they have uh, 20 projects in that area. And then Japan also has plans for, so they both have plans for about 100 stations in the next couple of years, and then 1,000 stations by 2025. And then here, Japan, um, their uh, main strategy is to put the stations out first, so it's not really a chicken and egg. And then they, they know there's going to be a delay. The cars are going to come out later. And they're focusing, especially with the 2020 Olympics, I don't know if anyone's been keeping track, but. Uh, because Toyota, Honda, the government's very, very uh, supportive um, in terms of hydrogen. Again, you can generate it with, when you look at countries like Korea, Japan, and others that import their natural gas, and they're you know, extremely, extreme, extremely cost prohibitive, any way that you can generate this resource on site, I think, is, is an advantage. Um, and in the U.S., to give you an idea, we produce uh, almost uh, roughly 10 million metric tons of hydrogen in the U.S., um, mostly, if you look at what it's used for, mostly petroleum refining. And as we see higher um, sulfur content in crude, there's going to be an even greater demand for hydrogen over time. So um, need for hydrogen. And then ammonia synthesis is the other big application right now. And then a, a lot of people don't realize that we already have over 1,500 miles of hydrogen pipeline. So in the Gulf Coast, um, California, there, there's quite a bit of pipeline already, mostly for these applications. There are about 50 stations, um, roughly 10 or so that are public, um, all in California. So that has, how many people have actually been to a hydrogen station? Okay, good, so a few of them. Um, and in fact, we were just talking today with, um, with Paul, uh, with your lab director and, and, and others about possibly having a, some demos here, having those little carts that, that you have driving around the campus. Um, we did the world's first ground support equipment um, in, at FedEx in Memphis. So these are the um, luggage tow tractors that take luggage like from the plane to the terminal. So those will be completely zero emissions. We're doing 15 in Memphis. We just had the kickoff. And we've done um, a, a huge number with uh, forklifts and backup power units. And so uh, basically, they're. There's a huge commitment. California, Governor Brown has signed on for 100 stations. Um, so, you know, lots of activities here in California. There are other states. And I think um, people are aware that there's an MOU for 3.3 million zero emission vehicles by 2025 across different states. So lots of uh, interest, I think, from the policy side to have zero emission vehicles. So how many people have heard of H2USA? Just a couple. So this was a, a huge thing for us um, before our previous secretary, Secretary Chu, left. He signed this um, public-private partnership. So similar to what the other countries like Germany, Japan, uh, and so forth have, we now have a U.S. partnership, H2USA, about 40 partners um, in the last year and a half. And of course, besides DOE, Governor Brown signed on. We have all the major car companies. And we have four working groups focusing. The, the main mission is how do we enable hydrogen infrastructure? And there's actually a pretty strong you know, lab component uh, as well with our, with our lab. And finally, um, I thought I'd end with just a few examples of outreach and education activities. And um, I think uh, some of you may have seen when our president went to um, Sweden uh, 
and went to an event uh, related to um, sustainable uh, transportation. He was looking at a little small portable fuel cell. We actually funded this uh, hydrogen storage uh, device. I already talked about secretary at the auto show, and of course our assistant secretary, our new deputy assistant secretary, Ruben Sarkar, filling up a hydrogen car. And then we have been doing quite a bit with trying to bring in the investment community. So I think some of the activities going on here in your tech transfer, the cyclotron road activities, you know, how do we build more interest and how do we bridge that gap between the R&D and kind of the lab basic science to applied science and even that valley of death between applied science and actual commercialization. So we're really, we held two investor days, one on the East Coast and we had Congressman um, Tonko and, and others, and then one on the West Coast at Stanford and we had brought in a bunch of investors and then showcased some of the fuel cell and hydrogen uh, company work to, to build that momentum and build that investment. So um, I thought I'd end with that and I also mentioned that when I first came to DOE, um, I still hadn't come to the government, but I was talking about how I work on fuel cells and, um, and it just so happened it was a, a pretty high level executive from the IT um, area and what he said is, oh, are you, finally when I finished the whole discussion, he said, oh, are you going to NIH? Because I said I was moving to government. And I was like, mm -hmm. and, and it turned out that he thought fuel cells were the same as stem cells. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it really points to the need for education and outreach. <laughs> so it kind of brings us back to the whole, and it's not even just the American public, it's even the, the educated, um, stakeholders that don't really know fuel cells or know, they don't you know, understand um, state-of-the-art technology. And so um, moving forward, um, our plans are to continue to strengthen the R&D activity, accelerate tech to market, is especially lab impact. Um, it's been very much focus of, of my personally. Um, and then we have you know, all of these areas, hydrogen and fuel cells. Uh, safety, of course, is critical. We're doing a lot there. Um, we've trained over 30,000 code officials and first responders so far, about 12,000 teachers. You know, how do we get the word out with this new technology? Places like Japan, Japan has TV commercials on fuel cells. I mean, there's you know, over 100,000 small stationary fuel cells. Here there's you know, basically you know, nothing in the, in, in the homes. Um, so we're, we're already, even though this is so, so much of an emerging technology, it's not like some of the more established technology. So how can we apply those lessons learned with batteries or, or solar and make sure with some of these earlier technologies we can maintain that re leadership role? Um, and then we're very strategic in our demonstrations. So, because obviously they're, they're a little bit more expensive. Um, we have industry cost share. And then we continue to conduct the, the key analysis uh, lots of interest in the life cycle cost assessment, the infrastructure, lots of modeling, you know, how do we get the cost down, what's the return on investment. That helps guide where the R&D is needed, so I think that's very critical. Um, and then leveraging activities to maximize impact. And then in terms of um, education and outreach, especially for the hydrogen community, Toyota put out this uh, interesting video, which I thought I would share. Over the next year, we'll be faced with a decision to support, oppose, or even ignore the future of hydrogen fuel propulsion. While there's no doubt that the need for an alternative to fossil fuel is real, the debate around hydrogen will intensify. There will be the naysayers, the handbrakes who say that it can't be done, that it's unsafe, that there's no infrastructure to support it. Then there'll be the trailblazers, the first to put up their hand and put down their foot. The bold few, driven to be remembered as those who made a difference, and perhaps the ones who made all the difference. So, as we travel down this hydrogen-paved highway, ready to mark a turning point in history, the question isn't if you'll turn, it's when. That was pretty well done. It was definitely not done by the technical uh, community. <laughs> so, it, but 
you know, in terms of, you know, really uh, capturing attention and, and the fact that, you know, we have to do something soon, right? We need the portfolio, we need some zero emission options. And so now I wanted to kind of wrap up with, you know, how can we more effectively achieve our goals? So whether it's, you know, your own career or the labs, industry, engagement, and, you know, it's, it's you know, planetary <laughs> problems here, right? It's, it's not just one individual or one lab, one entity or even one nation. Um, and so I wanted to kind of end with a few examples of, um, you know, I don't presume to offer advice. <laughs> so it's more just ideas that hopefully could, could be helpful for others. And I think everybody's heard of the Pareto Principle. So Italian economist in the early 1900s documented that, I guess he looked at the, um, the population in his area in Italy and documented that 20% of the people had 80% of the wealth. And then he looked at you know, many different examples. I think he uh, looked at the, his garden and found that 20 per, uh, 80% of the peas came from 20% of the pea pods. Um, and then all these little you know, examples. So for, for instance, you know, 80% or 20% of your effort leads to 80% of your results. Um, you know, you're, you know, 20% of your clients give you 80% of your sales. Um, and so even in an organization, you know, roughly, of course, this is a rule of thumb, and, and, um, but, you know, you, 20, you wear 20% of your wardrobe, 80% of your, your ta the time, um, and, you know, all these other examples. And so I think the key is that our output is not linear <laughs> with effort. And, um, and so how do we, you know, collectively, both individually, and collectively get to that point where you know you, you do the, it's the the right amount of effort on the right things so we maximize our results right I, I think that is has always been of, of interest and um, and the thing is that you, you can't it's not a question about just constantly working right it's, it's working smart as well um, and it's not so this is this is one um, you know good good quote that that I've always enjoyed um, that it's it's not really get the to do list right it's the process as well and this is the one that I thought goes well too for those of you how many people have a to do list <laughs> um, so. So in terms of both career and productivity, I think there has to be some balance. So I think if you tend to always be here or, or here, <laughs> you do tend to burn out after a while. Um, so there does need to be some balance. And then finally, I wanted to end with, how many people have heard of Napoleon Hill? Okay, a few, a few people. So he was um, born in the 1880s uh, in a cabin in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, he was actually very poor. His mother died when he was, I think, nine years old um, and lived a you know, very hard life. But when he was 13, he ended up working for a newspaper, uh, kind of a small newspaper, and he ended up meeting um, Andrew Carnegie. And he ended up becoming a, a famous author and did a lot of things. And what he did was he interviewed like 500 of the, the most successful people of the time, so presidents like Henry Ford, um, I think Alexander Bell, Thomas Edison, you know, all these famous, very successful people. And then he came up with what was called at the time the, the science of success. And he, you know, asked all of them, what was the most important thing that really helped you to succeed? And um, actually, I only found this out a couple of years ago. It's not like it helped me succeed, but um, I thought it was a very interesting um, Example and so he said, you know, basically what they they all said the number one thing that science of success is liter literally true that you can succeed best and quickest by helping others to succeed. So I thought I used this at one of the international meetings because especially with some of the new technologies or you know all of us with the same mission, clean energy technologies, reducing petrol petroleum greenhouse gas emissions. And in my case, I was really pushing safety. It took three years, but we got the Japanese government to agree to share safety information. We, we have a database now. We have a couple hundred vents. There's no attribution to company or country. We have a European Commission. Um, and, it, you know, if, if 
anything safety related, whether it's batteries, hydrogen, sharing across governments um, is really critical. And we um, streamlined it so there's no attribution and so forth. And we, they did agree, they had a big press conference, it was really good in, in Japan. And I still remember at one of the conferences, and I, I had this quote, and then later it was very gratifying because then one of the German um, Germans in this field, he said he used the same quote at some other conference that he went to. And so it's, you know, this crosses boundaries as well. So I thought that was a, a very interesting uh, outcome. So with that, I think I'll end. Thank you. Hey, Sunita, very nice talk. Thank you very much. It's very good. So I, I have a question regarding to the, uh, I feel it's interesting you show the investment uh, from different sectors, right? Those, are, I bet, are the American data, right? The data from this country. So do you have data for uh, global-wise? Yeah. And also, the, if you can divide it in different countries, how they invest in that, I think that would be really helpful for us to understand the global picture. And the follow on that question is, do you know why there's a such a low investment in the energy domain? So yeah, that's no, my that's question. a really good question, and I don't have the data with me, but there there is data. It's it's um, it's from one of the reports, I think, the congressional reports. Um, but and it depends. I think China was very high, Japan was high, um, and you know it it changes, of course, um, and I think it's. You know, it's, it's just hard to say. You know, I think now, especially with the low-cost shale, um, natural gas, um, every time, you know, the cost of, of gasoline is pretty low. When you look at many of these countries where investment is higher, the cost of fuel is higher. So it's, it's you know, it's difficult. It's, it's complicated. Um, but I think that is a big driver. And so when you look at the... Um, the energy resources as well. When you see some of these countries, you know, some places like Korea, you know, gas, um, natural gas can be like $18 per million BTU. And so, you know, as opposed to, you know, $3 or, or less here. And so that's, that's a big driver, I think. Um, and then for us, I think, you know, obviously there are other factors with the, the quality of life. And, you know, we only have 5% of the world's population that have know, almost a quarter of, or 20% of the, the world's emissions. So it's it's just different the way we've evolved over time. Um, so it's, it's challenging. But that's why I think it's really important to, that there has to be a product that, that consumers want. So it has to meet cost and it has to meet performance or be better in terms of performance. Uh, and I think that's where you see that the, the Toyotas and others trying to market um, or, or Tesla's, you know, the, the fuel cell vehicle gets 300 miles. We actually validated one that could go up to 430 miles range on just one tank. Um, and then, you know, very fast charging, just a few minutes of charging, good fuel economy, 60 miles per gallon. Um, so it, there has to be a, another driver, too. It can't just be environmental. Um, but that's a, a good question. Thank you for interesting talk. So I uh, I think the it's important to make uh, to make profit for the companies to continue the uh, development. So I think the market cannot be cannot cannot continue to be growing without profit. So so I actually I have been working in Toyota for fuel cell vehicle. So I already know how they uh, have been putting effort to make a non-profitable vehicle. So I think the, uh, we, we need some small trigger to make profit for small company to uh, the make market of fuel cell bigger. Mm. So I think that uh, if they can, they could have a small profit, 
by producing some products for pure cell society, the market can grow uh, more rapidly. I think the uh, government, I, I wonder if government uh, could make that kind of uh, uh, system or trigger for, yeah. uh, for small companies or mm -hmm. big companies. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. And we actually do have, um, for example, now we have a tax credit in um, the soon investment tax credit soon to expire, yeah. So that's part of the problem. So the policy side needs to match with the technology maturation side. So we actually did have a tax credit for infrastructure for stations. It was two hundred thousand dollars, which was quite, but that expired. And we have the um, the tax credit for fuel cells and other renewables. And actually, um, what we did with the Recovery Act, we actually did provide the trigger. We um, enabled about 1,600 forklifts, fuel cell forklifts. So um, we have major companies now, Walmart, um, FedEx, Cisco, Whole Foods, even Coca-Cola. So in their distribution centers, when they have, you know, the, the indoor ones, they want zero emissions, so they don't want propane. And so many of them had battery forklifts, but they had to wait several hours to charge the batteries, and they had to have a separate uh, room for replacement and so forth. And so we helped to spearhead the, some of the very first demonstrations for fuel cell forklifts in early market. And now we're tracking, uh, and backup power, so cell phone towers. Um, like Sprint, for example, they got a Recovery Act award. We did several hundred um, backup power units. So they're sitting at the cell phone towers. If the power goes down, uh, there's hydrogen and the fuel cell will provide the power. Um, and so now we're tracking over 11,000 that companies are putting in without our funding. So we were, you know, we, we helped to be that seed. That's what I talk about being, you know, having very strategic um, examples of tech to market. And that's an early market, you know, obviously it's not, there's not yet the large spread vehicle, but that helped to develop the supply chain, the catalyst companies, the balance of plant and the safety codes and standards and, you know, the community, the awareness. Um, and so now we're looking at other markets as well. So things like the ground support equipment, of course, buses is another example. We're, we also have FedEx and UPS for parcel delivery vans. So um, I think that's exactly right. It's, it's hard to go from you know, zero. It's, this is completely new technology and there's gonna be, take time, but how do we accelerate that? Um, and so having those, those examples, creating those niche markets and having some sort of so early profit for the companies is really critical. So I think that that's good. And that's part of our whole strategy as well. It's not just about the, the R&D. First of all, it was a very inspiring presentation. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Particularly that, that yeah, the, the, the last quote was actually, I, it, it really touched me in the sense that, that it was through collaborations with other people here in different divisions, particularly the facilities, that I recently got the early career, the DOE early career, so I'm really grateful for that. Uh, and having that in mind, uh, how, do, how do you think that other, uh, other branches of DOE could support the mission of a few cell technologies uh, in many, for example, ASCAR, I imagine, I mean, you generate tons of data. How could we possibly help uh, your branch to do a better job? Um, I mean, we have from processing signals to images, a lot of uh, uh, experiments uh, within DOE are image-based experiments, and that's exactly the theme of my, my early career. So how could people like me could help you? Oh, okay, that's a great question. Let me get your name. <laughs> no, but um, you said Oscar? That's a first class. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. program manager, that's the same thing. Different than the other <laughs> <one>. <laughs> um, So, yeah, so in fact, that's a perfect segue into we're trying to do the first example of an EERE and Oscar collaboration. Um, and we actually have a PCASE awardee that, from um, LBNL. Uh, Adam Weber, who, and we're doing a seed project where we're going to give him a couple of hundred K and then have Oscar provide a couple of hundred K and actually determine how exactly, because we don't, you know, I think it's important for us not to dictate. We, we can create the environment and set the targets and say what we need, but have flexibility among the labs and industry and others. Cause it, it shouldn't be, I think the biggest challenge and frustration for us is it ends up always being about funding. And, and so everybody's spending all their time trying to, you know, worry about funding. 
and how do we really incentivize the ideas? And so our, our idea was this would be a seed project and we would um, kind of have this marriage between Oscar and the applied programs and try to figure out and, and see what are the ideas that would enable something that's more sustainable and create this framework for moving forward. So things like you know a virtual fuel cell and how do we get all that modeling? There's you know lots of data, the combinatorial high throughput activity, for instance. Like how can we accelerate our our progress um, and have the computational feed into? So it's exactly the kind of thing that we're we're planning to do. It'll be a pilot. So we in fact we just talked about that today. I think you put a number of about $280 a kilowatt hour. That's about where batteries are today. Um, except except we, w there's an infrastructure now for electricity, but not one for hydrogen. Do you expect hydrogen to replace electricity, or are there certain geographies that you think hydrogen makes a more sense than electricity? Um, well, I should say, actually, I think I might have a. It's yeah, per, yeah, I was going to say. It's Oh, kilowatt. Oh. <laughs> That's a, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, it's 280 um, per kilowatt. Okay. And then that's, again, a, a very low volume. Because right now at the one off scale, you know, low volume, um, I think that was estimates from the car companies at like 20,000 units. But ultimately, it would be you know, millions. So it's a 500,000 unit. Um, number we were basically at, you know, uh, well I was going to try to find a backup slide, but I can just talk to it. We have, um, I think the the key is that the total vehicle, so both from the battery perspective and the fuel cell perspective, the total um, cost of ownership on a cents per mile basis needs to be equivalent or, or close enough to conventional vehicles. Um, and so when you project, it's the initial cost of the infrastructure that's really high. If you look at the total cost of ownership for battery electric vehicles, um, because you have the charger cost per vehicle, um, one station can fuel you know, hundreds and thousands of vehicles. So when you look at that total infrastructure cost perspective, on a cents per mile basis, they're really not that different. Um, the electric vehicle versus the fuel, I mean, they're both electric vehicles, but fuel cell and electric. And then the other is, um, I think your point of having niche markets, things like the, um, I, I tried not to make it, I have a lot of more technical detail here, but, oh yeah, this is the one I thought would be good to show. Um, So, yeah, yeah, so kind of the example of um, where the battery vehicle really makes sense. If we, if we look at a portfolio of technologies, um, and of course we're, we're all trying to improve you know, all of the technologies, but so we, so we don't put all our eggs in one basket. Um, if we look at where um, driving range and duty cycle is appropriate for like the pure EVs, um, plug-in hybrid, and then fuel cell vehicles, and very high energy density, liquid fuels, biofuels, for example, for a uh, very long driving range and high duty cycle. That's sort of the, the, the thinking in, t in terms of your question of, you know, where does it make sense? And then even if we met, this is, if we meet our targets, um, BEVs really make sense for a uh, short driving range, and then in terms of both mass you know, vehicle weight and cost. And then the fuel cell vehicle, if you're over about, depends on your assumptions here, but 100 to 150 miles, um, the battery scales, you know, linear, linearly, and the fuel cell is fixed, and then you just add more hydrogen. So, you know, one kilogram of hydrogen gives you 60 miles. So that's where it really makes sense if you have long driving range. Um, and so for the type of vehicle class, like the larger SUVs, for instance, where a pure EV is challenging, that's where it, it makes more sense. So, so sort of, I think you have exactly the right, right um, 
view in terms of thinking of the right application, what market segmentation makes sense for fuel cells. But on a cents per mile basis, they're not that different in terms of um, infrastructure. Okay, I wasn't sure it wasn't there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, great, thank you.